Well, good morning. There we go. Now you can hear me better. Good morning. And welcome to worship for Sunday, November the 14th. And uh, I do have a couple of announcements and just a reminder that we're doing the Christmas gift cards again this year for uh, the purchase of Walmart cards going to some uh, needy families in our area. And uh, Judy Skinner is heading that up uh, for us. And uh, if you want to make a donation to that uh, purchase, then you can uh, let Judy know or get a hold of Colleen. And Colleen has set up a new email address for e-transfers, which is <clears throat> R-U-C, Riverside United Church, R-U-C Yarker at gmail.com. And the R-U-C and Y are uppercase. If you want to send something through to her, um, November the 23rd, a Tuesday, I have it right, right Art? Tuesday, the 23rd of November, we are having a, uh, an official board meeting and it's going to be done via Zoom and I have already included the link in last week's newsletter and I'll do so again until that meeting. If anybody wants uh, to, to uh, participate in the meeting but isn't comfortable with Zoom, you can let me know. And uh, we'll, um, uh, I'll work out giving you a phone number that you can actually participate via the phone. Are there any other announcements? I know Karen has at the back a uh, fund script, the uh, way of purchasing gift cards to various retailers, and uh, uh, Riverside obtains uh, a percentage of a rebate back to the church. It's a great fundraising opportunity and also a great way of just uh, supporting the church and buying some gift cards for Christmas. If you do, uh, see Karen. Or in the newsletter, I'll be sending some links out as well too. No other announcements? Well, let us gather, shall we? May the faithful one be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts to the one who has reconciled us. We are reminded as we light this Christ candle that Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And it is with that that we light this Christ candle so that we are inspired to offer worship. Amen. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked on this, their land, and their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. And as we gather in our homes, let us acknowledge their stewardship of the land throughout the ages. And these lands are still home to many First Nations people, uh, First Nations and Métis people. And we are grateful to have an opportunity to gather for worship, not only in our churches, but in our homes, as we continue the stewardship on this land. Join with me in our statement of faith, the new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. What to bring before the Lord this day? And what do you bring to the Lord this day? We collectively bring our hopes and dreams to the Lord. And what do we seek? We seek peace for our weary souls. 
And you will indeed find it in this place, for this is the house of the Lord. And open our hearts and our spirits, O Lord, to hear the words of your comfort and peace. Amen. Come before God with the truth of our lives is itself an act of faith. And we trust that the Holy One is interested in us, interested in our minds, our hearts, and our souls. And we trust that God's mercy and grace are intended for us too. With faith and in trust, let us make our confession to God first with a moment of silent prayer. Join with me in our responsive prayer of confession. Our hearts are hard, O God. Our hands are clenched, O God. Our feet are planted too firmly, O God. Our lives are not our own. We know. Amen. We long to mend our ways. Christ can bear these sins for all who eagerly wait for him. His sacrifice on our behalf, his grace towards us, washes us anew. And Holy One, as we hear your scripture, we ask that you open our eyes, that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we have lectionary readings here. 1 Samuel 1, uh, 4 to 20, or 1 Samuel 2, 1 to 10, the song of, of Hannah. And Bill is going to read for us from the book of Hebrews, 11 to 25. It's a pleasure to be here greeting you today.
Hebrews 10. Every priest goes to work at the altar each day, offers the same old sacrifices year in and year out, and never makes a dent in the sin problem. As a priest, Christ made a single sacrifice for sins, and that was it. Then he sat down right beside God and waited for his enemies to cave in. It was a perfect sacrifice, sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very perfect people. By that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. The Holy Spirit confirms this with this quote. This new plan I'm making with Israel isn't going to be written on paper. It is not going to be ch chiseled in stone. This time, I'm writing out the plan in them, carving it on the lining of their hearts. He concludes, I'll forever wipe the slate clean of their sins. Once sins are taken care of for good, there's no longer any need to, to offer sacrifices for them. So friends, we can now, without hesitation, walk right up to God and to the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of the sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. The curtain into God's presence is his body. Let's do it. Full of belief, confident that we're presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. As he walked away from the temple, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at that stonework, those buildings. Jesus said, You're in, impressed by the grandiose architecture? There's not a stone in the whole works that is not going to end up in a heap of rubble. Later, as he was sitting on, sitting on Mount Olives, in the view of the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew got him off by saying and asked, Tell us, when is this going to happen? What sign will we get that things are coming to a head? Jesus began, Watch out for doom, doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities claiming, I am the one. They will deceive a lot of people. When you hear of wars and rumored wars, keep your head, don't panic. This is routine history and no sign of the end. Nation will fight nation and ruler fight ruler over and over. Earthquakes will occur in various places. places. There will be there will famines. famines. But these things, but these are, things nothing are nothing compared, compared to, what is to what is coming. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. May these, the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Anyways, as you can see, the title of today's sermon is Just Stones. This past week, I had the occasion to host a very dear friend and colleague at the manse. He was there for a little, a little bit of a restorative time away during some much-needed vacation time from his own ministry. He was also there because of a, a need to be surrounded by friends who cared and who support him during a time of strife in his life. Part of our time this week, I, I took him on a tour of, of Kingston. And as we drove around and I gave him the tour of the, city, uh, of the city and the many of its landmark institutions and buildings, he said that he never realized that Kingston was as large as it was. And as I reflected back this week on 
this guided tour, as I called it, Phil's tour, I said to him that we tend to never realize the beauty of the place that we call home until we take a visitor, a, a visitor such as himself on the drive around the neighborhood. But I also reflect, and, and what I highlighted on that tour was the grandiose nature of the buildings. Kingston, of course, as many of you know, is the limestone city. Of course, not all of the limestone city's buildings are that large sort of buildings. Many of the original homes were quarried from the stone found on the property where they were building their homes. At least according to one website that I had found that was dedicated to acknowledging the stonemanship of those homes. But if you think about it, Kingston has many sites that are, are indeed made from very many large stones. Even here at East Camden Pastoral Church, we have the building of Moscow United Church made from very large stones. Riverside's building is made of stones as well, if you will. It's a more of a modern day church, just not made from the large stones like Moscow, for example, or like the large stones we hear in today's gospel lesson. We hear of, of how Jesus and the disciples are standing in the temple courtyard and are mesmerized by the architectural majesty that are surrounding them. And Jesus is asked, take, take notice. Look, Lord, what large stones, what large buildings we have in this temple. According to historians, that of the first century at least, the, the temple was indeed an awe-inspiring wonder. Newly constructed by King Herod the Great, the temple's retaining walls were composed of stones nearly 40 feet long. And the footprint twice as large, if you will, of the Roman Forum. And it's reported that Herod used so much gold to cover the outside of the walls that staring at the wall in the direct sunlight, you ran a risk of losing your vision because of the reflection. We hear of the disciples and how they are impressed and they seek to share that sense of awe with Jesus. But Jesus is not impressed or bedazzled, if you will, of the buildings and its grandiose size. In fact, Jesus responds by asking a, request, a question of them. Do you see these great buildings? It does beg the question, at least, why Jesus is asking a question like this, when clearly the disciples do see the buildings they apparently are looking at the same buildings, aren't they? Clearly, Jesus' response tells us that they are indeed not looking at the same buildings at all. What the disciples see is an architectural wonder or marvel, at least for a person like me who has trouble building anything like a house for sure, even out of matchsticks or whatever. And I've had the luxury of visiting some of the, the larger churches in, in Montreal, for example, and I do stand there in awe of the size of the building, the, the beauty outside and inside. And I would ask probably Jesus the same thing. Should be Jesus be standing there in front or with me as we stood in front of, say, the Basilica of Notre Dame, looking at the beauty of that church. Asking, aren't you impressed by the, the size of that church? The disciples' view of the church building is that the larger the better. For in his mind, this disciple who poses the question, the biggest, the boldest, and the most unshakable symbol of God's presence is in that church. 
And he is capable of imagining that church buildings indeed symbolize who we are as a believer in God, a believer in Jesus, and the mission and ministry of sharing the good news of God to those around the building. When you look at our two church buildings in this pastoral charge, people believe that they know what we believe in and who we are because of the stones that represent us. The stones of our buildings, according to this disciple who asks Jesus that question, they hold a religious memory, a religious place within its community offering a potent symbol of spirituality, of spiritual glory, of pride and worthiness. Jesus, though, Jesus does not see through the same eyes or see the same as our disciple here. Jesus says he looks and he sees ruin, rubble, destruction, fragility, not permanence, loss, not glory, change, and not stasis. He says no one No one stone will be left here upon another. And Jesus tells these disciples who are now stunned, all will be thrown down. Wow. I mean, Jesus speaking of an apocalyptic outcome of the highly regarded temple of the church. And if you accept the view that any apocalypse is how we, it is how we see it, portrayed on TVs or movies, then you have to wonder what Jesus was talking about. But in fact, a, an apocalypse means something very different. Let me offer you a, a couple of words of definition. An unveiling or an uncovering. That's what a An apocalypse means an an unveiling or an uncovering, a disclosure of something hidden, a secret. To experience an apocalypse is to experience a fresh and new insight. This is what Jesus is offering the disciples as they stand in awe in that courtyard looking at the temple offering them an unveiling, an uncovering of a new insight. Jesus offers a fresh outlook, a fresh outlook at our stone buildings known as churches, asking us to recognize that God will not be domesticated asking us to recognize that the temple or the church is not the epicenter of God's saving work. God is not bound by brick and mortar. God exceeds containment, the symbolism, the institutions, the mission statements, every strategic plan and every symbol of human beings created in God's name. God is more than all of those. Jesus teaches the disciples and us that beyond what the large stones of the temple represents, that they are able to look beyond that. And then offers them this, don't be alarmed, for God is not where people often say God is. And Jesus also speaks of the nature of God. That God does not fearmonger, God does not incite suspicion, God does not thrive on human dread. My friends, God is not contained within the greatest of church buildings nor the smallest of church buildings. God is not present in the wooden church nor the large stone church buildings. God is present. In you, you, the faithful witnesses of God that moves outward, not inward. 
For me, there is a beauty in the knowledge that, that God lives. God moves, God inspires, God loves all of us through the witness that you go out to offer, not within these walls of our church buildings, but the witness that you are called to, the sharing of the good news of what happens. Yes, when you gather in community, in a community of faith within these walls, but more importantly, what happens outside of these walls. And that, my friends, is all because of God's uncontained, unconditional love for us. And for that, I say, Amen. Each day of our lives, we are presented with opportunities to respond to, to God's love and give of ourselves in faithful service. And there are many ways to give, each according to our own abilities, all with the gifts working together for the sake of the mission and ministry entrusted to us by God. And your offering and your gift is Received in gratitude, gratitude to God for the ongoing work and ministry of this East Camden pastoral charge. Today, O oh Lord, we offer you our sacrifice of time, energy, and love, knowing full well that they are mere tokens of the awesome faith you inspire within us. 
Blessed be the name of God. Let us come together and unify our hearts, offering our prayer of thanksgiving and concern. Let us pray. There is a response that I just remembered. When you hear me say, let us pray, your response is, fill us, O God, with your words and wisdom. Lord, we pray for all the people, all the people of this world in their daily life and work. We pray for our families and our friends and neighbors. And blessed God, who caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant us to hear them, read them, mark them, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may be embraced and that we may embrace and hold Fast, the blessed hope of everlasting life, signs of heaven and sighs of hope. And let us pray. Blessed God, we ask your care for those who are victims of wars and insurrections, that they may not be terrified. For nations rising against nations, let your love, steadfast and faithful, be a great sign from heaven. And may your peace bend our will to your will like trees in a strong wind. Signs of heaven, sighs of hope. Let us pray. Blessed God, grant your healing grace to the many places we hear of in our daily newscasts. For those places far away and those places within our own country, in our neighborhoods, and our province. Let your love, steadfast and faithful, be a great sign from heaven. And may your peace bend our will to your will like trees in a strong wind. Signs of heaven sighs of hope and let us pray blessed God when we are weary help us to do what is right do not let us be led astray help us to come in your name praising your goodness and let your love steadfast and faithful be a great sign from heaven, and may your peace bend our will to your will like trees in a strong wind. Signs of heaven, sighs of hope. And let us pray. And blessed God, for we know the love that you have for all of humanity. We now offering, offer these names of those who weigh heavy on our hearts and minds. We ask that they may know your healing presence. Al, 
the McQuay family, Darren, Art, Phil D, Gerald, Rebecca, Steve, Will, Gretchen, Justin, Bob and Sharon, Brent M, Lindsay, Reed, Virginia, Marg, Harry and Janet, Nina, Bernie and her son-in-law, and Amadeus. Let us pray. And blessed Lord, we thank you for all the blessings of this life, for the gift of life, for the gift of Christ, for the gift of the Holy Spirit and your tender mercy, for your saving love. Let your love, steadfast and faithful, be a great sign from heaven, and may your peace bend our will to your will like trees in a strong wind, signs of heaven, sighs of hope. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who teaches us to pray as he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My friends, God's blessing be upon us. As we leave and return change to our homes, may we strengthen and encourage one another in our shared vision. And may the blessings of our adv adventurous creator God go with us. May the blessings of the Son who showed us how to live reshape us and the blessing of the dancing spirit joyfully enable us for our renewed living. I ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.